So here we are again. Hi, it's me, Georgia May Mossholder, back with Max Licato's book, When God Whispers Your Name. And chapter 7 is titled, Behind the Shower Curtain. Hmm. I'm going to have to install a computer in my shower. That's where I have my best thoughts. I had a great one today. I was mulling over a recent conversation I had with a disenchanted Christian brother. He was upset with me, so upset that he was considering rescinding his invitation rescinding his invitation for me to speak to his group. Seems he'd heard I was pretty open about whom I have fellowship with. He'd read the words I wrote. If God calls a person his child, shouldn't I call him my brother? And if God accepts others with their errors and misinterpretations, shouldn't we? Well, fences are necessary, he explained. Scriptures are clear on such and such and whatever such and is, urged me to be careful to whom I give grace. I don't give it, I assured. I only spotlight where God already has. Didn't seem to satisfy him. I offered to bow out of the engagement. The break would be nice. But he softened and told me to come after all. And that's where I am going today. That's why I was thinking about him in the shower, and and that's why I need a waterproof computer. I had a great thought. Uh, why didn't I think to say that in sight? I hope to see him today. If the subject resurfaces, I'll say it. But in case it doesn't, I'll save it. I'll say it to you. It's too good to waste. Just one sentence. I've never been surprised by God's judgment, but I'm still stunned by his grace. God's judgment has never been a problem for me. In fact, it's always seemed right. Lightning bolts on Sodom, fire on Gomorrah. Good job, God. Egyptians swallowed in the Red Sea. Well, they had it coming. Forty years of wandering to loosen the stick necks of the Israelites. I would have done it myself. Ananias and Sapphira? You bet. Discipline is easy for me to swallow, logical to assimilate, manageable and appropriate. But God's grace... Anything but. Examples? How much time do you have? David, the psalmist, becomes David the voyeur, but by God's grace becomes David the psalmist again. Peter denied Christ before he preached Christ. Zacchaeus, the crook, the cleanest part of his life was the money he'd laundered, but still Jesus had time for him. The thief on the cross, hell-bent and hung out to die one minute, heaven-bound and smiling the next. Story after story, prayer after prayer, surprise after surprise. Seems that God is looking more for ways to get us home than for ways to keep us out. I challenge you to find one soul who came to God seeking grace and did not find it. Search the pages, research, read the stories, envision the encounters. First, one, one person who came seeking a second chance and left with a stern lecture. I dare you, search. You won't find it. You will find a strayed sheep on the other side of the creek. He, he's lost, and he knows it. He's stuck and embarrassed. What will the other sheep say? What will the shepherd say? You will find a shepherd who finds him. Oh boy, duck down. Put hoofs over the eyes. The belt is about to fly. But the belt is never felt. Just hands. 
large open hands reaching under his body and lifting the sheep up, 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 until he's placed upon the shepherd's shoulders. He's carried back to the flock and given a party. Cut the grass and comb the wool, he announced. We're going to have a celebration. The other sheep shake their heads in disbelief, just like we all, we will. At our party, when we get home, when we watch the shepherd shoulder into our midst one unlikely soul after another, seems to me God gives a lot more grace than we've ever imagined. We could do the same. I'm not for watering down the truth or compromising the gospel, but if I follow with a pure heart, calls God Father, can't I call that same man brother? If God doesn't make doctrinal perfection a requirement for family membership, should I? I read that wrong, by the way. I'm going to read it again. I'm not for watering down the truth or com compromising the gospel. But if a fellow with a pure heart calls God Father, can't I call that same man brother? If God doesn't make doctrinal perfection a requirement for family membership, should I? That's a good point. And if we never agree, can't we agree to disagree? If God can tolerate my mistakes, can't I tolerate the mistakes of others? If God can overlook my errors, can't I overlook the errors of others? If God allows me with my foibles and failures to call him Father, shouldn't I extend the same grace to others? One thing's for sure. When we get to heaven, we'll be surprised at some of the folks we'll see. And some of them will be surprised when they see us. Chapter 8 Gabriel's Questions Gabriel must have scratched his head at this one. He wasn't one to question his God-given missions. Sending fire and dividing seas, seas were all in an attorney work for this angel. When God sent, Gabriel went. And when word got out that God was to become a man... Gabriel was enthused. He could envision the moment. The Messiah in a blazing chariot. The king descending on a fiery cloud. An explosion of light from which the Messiah would emerge. That's what he expected. What he never expected, however, was what he got. A slip of paper with a Nazarene address. God will become a baby, it read. Tell the mother to name the child Jesus and tell her not to be afraid. Well, Gabriel was never one to question, but this time he had to wonder. God will become a baby? Gabriel had seen babies before. He had been platoon leader on the bulrush operation. He remembered what little Moses looked like. That's okay for humans, he thought to himself. But God? Huh. The heavens can't contain him. How could a body? Besides, have you seen what comes out of those babies? Hardly befitting for the creator of the universe. Babies must be carried and fed and bounced and bathed. To imagine some mother burping God on her shoulder... Why, that was beyond what even an angel could imagine. And what of his name? What was it? Jesus? Such a common name. There's a Jesus in every cul-de-sac. Come on, even Gabriel has much more punch to it than Jesus. Call the baby eminence of majesty or heaven sent. Anything but Jesus. So J Gabriel scratched his head. What happened to the good old days, the Sodom and Gomorrah stuff, flooding the globe and uh, flaming swords? That's the action he liked. 
But Gabriel had his orders. Take the message to Mary. Must be a special girl, he assumed as he traveled. But Gabriel was in for another shock. One peak told him Mary was no queen. The mother, too, of God was not regal. She was a Jewish peasant who barely outgrown her acne and had a crush on a guy named Joe. And speaking of Joe, what does this fellow know? Might as well be a weaver in Spain or a cobbler in Greece. He's a carpenter. Look at him over there, sawdust in his beard and nail apron around his waist. You're telling me God is going to have to dinner every night with him? You're telling me the source of wisdom is going to call this guy Dad? You're telling me a common laborer is going to be charged with giving food to God? What if he gets laid off? What if he gets cranky? What if he decides to run off with a pretty young girl from down the street? What if he decides to run off with a pretty young girl from down the street? Then where will we be? It was all Gabriel could do to keep from turning back. This is a peculiar idea you have, God, he must have muttered to himself. Are God's guardians given to such musings? Are we? Are we still stunned by God's coming, still staggered by the event? Does Christmas still spawn the same speechless wonder it did 2,000 years ago? I've been asking that question lately to myself. As I write, Christmas is only days away, and something just happened that has me concerned that the pace of the holidays may be overshowing the purpose of the holidays. I saw a manger in a mall. Correct that. I barely saw a manger in a mall. I almost didn't see it. I was in a hurry. Guests coming. Santa dropping in. Sermons to be prepared and services to be planned. Presents to be purchased. The crush of things was so great that the creech creech of Christ was almost ignored. I nearly missed it. And had it not been for the child and his father, I would have. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw them. The little boy, three, maybe four years old, in jeans and high tops, staring at the manage manger's infant. The father, his baseball hat and work clothes, looking over his son's shoulder, gesturing first at Joseph and then Mary and then the baby. He was telling the little fellow the story. And oh, the twinkle in the boy's eye, the wonder on his little face. He didn't speak, he just listened. And I didn't move, I just watched. What questions were filling the little boy's head? Could they have been the same as Gabriel's? What sparked the amazement of his face? Was it the magic? Why is it that out of a hundred or so of God's children, only two paused to consider his son? Why is the December demon that steals our eyes and steals our tongue? Not why. What is the December demon that steals our eyes and steals our tongues? Isn't this the season to pause and pose Gabriel's questions? The tragedy is not that we can't answer them, but that we are too busy to ask them. Only heaven knows how long Gabriel fluttered unseen above Mary before he took a breath and broke the news. But he did. He told her the name. He told her the plan. He told her not to be afraid. And when he announced... With God, nothing is impossible. He said it as much for himself as for her. For even though he couldn't answer the questions, he knew who could, and that was big enough. And he even thought, and even though we can't answer them all, taking time to ask a few would be a good start. 
And that's it for today. I'm going to have to stop. Chapter 9. What is your price? I'll be back with that tomorrow. See you soon.